Colossians 1.19, Hote en Auto. Hote? En? Auto? Udakesen? Pan? To? Play Roma? Katoi Kese. These, these verses are loaded with theology. Now what is theology? Oh, what's the word theology mean? These verses are loaded with theology. Well, that was a loaded question, wasn't it? Okay. Theo what? Is God. What? Theo is not God. That Theos is God. Logi. Theology. The study of God. These verses are are full, are filled with the study of God. Now, we have to go back. How, does anyone, do you have a Anyone have a Bible open to, to just read this from New American Standard or New Interlatin, International Version or something? You've got something there. Yeah, New, American Standard. New American Standard, brother. Thank you. <laughs> just read 16, 17, 18, and then let's come up to 19 because we can't study this one without getting... See, it starts because. Because of what? Something that was said before. Go ahead, brother. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the bodies, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. In nineteen no, we, we're going to read 19 now. But we had to come up. It makes a statement that in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the head of the physical, material creation of God. Now, we studied that some last week, too. But he is the originator of it. He is the source of everything that is seen and everything that is unseen. That is which is visible and that which is invisible. All right? And then it says in verse 19, Hote, because in him, because in him, now we have a practical substantive in here. In him, God. Now right after Alto there, you can put Theos if you want to. All right? Because God is in this verse. Because in him, it pleased God. All the fullness. And here we get again, we have a practical substance they brought in there. In the fullness of God to dwell. Because it's understood, this verse is understood that in Christ, all of God was in Christ. What does it say there in, in, in that same verse in New American Standard, brother, now? Uh, 19. Mm -hmm. Verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. All right, all the fullness of God. It was the Father's good pleasure. That's God. God the Father's good pleasure, remember I said Theos. That the fullness of God, Theu now, the fullness of Theu, to dwell. And the word dwell there means kata and oikese. First aorist, infinitive active. Kata means what in Greek? Kata. 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 Kata means down. Or according to. Down or according to. And then we have the word oikos in this verse. Or in this, in this word. Kata and oikos. Oikos is what? Oikos is your uh, casa. House. All right. House. All right. Kata, to down home. In Spanish, how would you say that? To, to, to down home. To dwell in the casa. All right. Any, any of you Spanish <coughs> geniuses know that? How do you, how do you be in the, in the house? In home. All right. What? In La Casa. In La Casa. All right. Now, the 
the home of God in the flesh was the person of Jesus Christ. As simple as that. God dwelled in him. God made his home. God made his home in Christ. The fullness of God. The pleroma. The fullness of God. How much of God? Pon to pleroma. Pon is what? That means everything. All of the fullness of God to dwell. The fullness of God to dwell in Christ. All right, number number 20. Verse number 20. <coughs> Kai? Diatu? Apo kata la se. Pa? Panta? Ace? Alton? Ere no poese. Dia, two, Haimatoi, Haimatos, that is. Two, Staru, how to, and then we have in parenthesis, Dia, how to. Now that's in parenthesis, remember that, that's understood practical substance again. And some of the manuscripts have it in there. And then it says, Ete. Ta, 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 epi, taste, gaze, ate, ta, in, toys, uranois. <coughs> and dia. That's where D here, that's a that's a contracted form or a shortened form of Dia. It just has it has D delta e, Iota there just for euphony. See we have an, an alpha, that dia ends with the alpha, and then we have altun. Kai di altun. See that? Kai di altu. In other words, you just leave it off. In other words, it would be Kai Dia Altu. But they would throw it together and make it sound better by Diatu. And by the agency of him. Who's him? Who's the him there? You can write down there in parentheses someplace Jesus. God the Son. Alright? And then it comes from a, a really compound attic word. Attic. Now, how many of you ever read in your Bible and it'll say from attic? It wasn't talking about the attic in somebody's house. Attic. How many of you know what attic means in reference to Greek? Attic. A-T-T-I-C. Attic. This is an old attic word. Athenian. It comes from Athens. That's where this dialect, this word originated was in Athens. Okay? A very highly educated area. All right? Athens, so you, that, if you want to write that word down, attic, that way you'll know more than your pastors know, okay? You ask one of them what attic means, and they probably wouldn't tell you. <laughs> All right? This is, this is continuous education here. We're, we're going further in Greek than what they teach in the seminary today. All right, Mark. What? What? What did you say it meant? What? What'd you say it meant? Attic. Athens. From Athens, Greece. Okay, that's an authentic word, all right? It come from Athens, Athens or Attic. It uh, <coughs> comes from Apo and Kato and, and uh, Lasso. It's used three times in the New Testament, nowhere else in Greek writings, as far as we know. This word only used three times in the New Testament and no place else in Greek literature as far as we can know. It means to uh, to take someone that is an enmity and hatred with someone else and make all things right. It means that someone that is a criminal condemned to death, 
someone that uh, had committed some hideous crime, and that hideous crime is paid for, totally paid for. That's the word. That's the, what this word kata, apo kata lakse. All right, apo and kata and lasso. That's what that word means. It means to totally reconcile. It means to atone for something. And how much of it does he atone for? And it says ta panta. All things. Before you were saved. Every sin that you had sinned, when you come to the Lord and ask the Lord to forgive you, the Lord forgave you of all those sins. That's a, that's a biblical, theological fact. When you came to the Lord and repented, now you can't get saved without repenting. Well, what does repenting mean? Does anybody know what repenting means? Huh? Turn around. It means a cross mind. It, it means to completely change your idea of right and wrong. You know, when we're lost, we have a total different set of ethics than we are when we are saved. When we are, when we are lost, we have our own set of ethics in the world. But when we are saved, we have to set aside those ethics and we have to accept God's ethics. And the first thing you do when you come to God as a lost sinner is you say that I'm an adulterer, I'm a liar, I'm a gambler, I'm a thief, I'm a, I'm a cheat. And you say, Lord, forgive me of those things. Forgive me of them. And then that which was taking you to hell, then you hate like God hated it. Okay? You are to hate those things like, like God hated them. Hate it. I remember one time, I've been reading the book uh, about and by Samuel Clemens. How many of you know who Samuel Clemens is? Huh? Mark? Uh, <coughs> who is that? Uh, Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Mark Twain was an absolute character. Mark Twain was very religious, but he studied a lot of church history, and he had a, he had a real bitter resentment toward the Catholic Church. I wish some Baptist, I mean, he was raised a Presbyterian, but Presbyterians came right out of Catholicism. You know, John Calvin left the Catholic Church and, and started the Presbyterian Church, which was a, not a whole lot different than the Catholic Church at that time, but except for salvation by grace. And uh, Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens, he saw what we call uh, religion in his day, and he wasn't very happy with it especially church history and, and what uh, the, the Church of Rome had done to Christians all down to the ages and other people. He said, uh, the church, and when he means the church, he's talking about Catholicism, did everything that they could do to stamp out witches in the Dark Ages. They killed them, burned them, uh, slit their throats, chopped their heads off. They did everything they could do with witches. And he said, uh, the, the church in the world was done with them. Then all of a sudden we find out there really weren't any such things as witches, but they got rid of them anyway. Well, what Mark Twain didn't know, some of those witches that they had burned and, and slipped their throats and crucified and everything else were Baptist. They, they, uh, they crucified and burned a lot of Baptists at the stake and guillotine them and everything you can think of for being witches because they could read and write. They wrote, they would read and write the Word of God. Well, Mark Twain was a character. The time he got up before Congress, he said, you know, he said, I kind of feel like the old boy getting up here and talking before all you people. He said, if America has a inborn criminal state, a really American criminal, he said, I think it is the lawyers and politicians of Congress. And here I am standing before you people. He said, I kind of feel like the old boy that, that was out till late in the morning, but he had a real good heart about him. He was out late in the morning, 
drinking. He was drinking too much. And he said he staggered down the street and he finally found out where he lived. And he looked at the stairs and the stairs were really moving hard. They were just going like this. So when they settled down in the middle where he was, he just took a leap at it and made it up those stairs. And he got up to the door and he, and he got down on his hands and knees and he looked at the door and there the door was going like this. Then he said when he got settled down right about in the middle, he jumped up real fast and went through that door and hit the floor in there to make sure. And he said the floor was just going like this. And then he said he looked up at the stairs and the stairs were going like this. Well, his bedroom was upstairs and the stairs were going like this. And he got up there and he, when they settled down right in the middle about where he was, he took a run up those stairs he, on his hands and knees just to go on as fast as he could go. And he got up there at the top of the stairs in the hallway and he just laid down. And he said, God, please watch all over them sailors out in those rough seas like this. He said, I feel so sorry for them. <laughs> please watch over them. they got to put up with this every day. <clears throat> he said, here I am in the midst. <laughs> of the criminal state. <laughs> well, <coughs> we're all criminals in sight of God. We don't really like to say how bad we are till we come to the point of repentance. <coughs> Drunks and gamblers and liars and thieves and murderers and whatever. And all of a sudden we come to God and we realize those are bad sins. Because that's what Jesus died for. He died for those sins. He died for every one of them. That all things in Him. And then, it, then we have the word, re ne no poi asos. That long word down there. It's not in the singular master, first service, part of simple and active. It comes from a rainy, and it comes from poio, and it comes from law. It comes from all these words. The law says, you shall not defraud your fellow man. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. Morality. What is morality? Adherence to the moral law. Can you be a moral person and not, and not say <clears throat> can you be a moral person and not saved? Can you be a morally sound person and not saved? My wife and close friends with a person over on the coast. The man was raised up, he was from the state of misery, Missouri, to speak a lot. He's got a real coarse character to him, coarse, coarse language and everything. But the man knows right from wrong. And he has, a, he has a work ethic that he works hard for a living. He, he tried to put that and instill in his children. And he has two children that are very religious. But they dress up in religion. Because the moral soundness that he has, they do not have whatsoever. Now those children... Say they're acquainted with the Lord. They should have led their father to the Lord, even though he's morally sound and more morally sound than they are today. But God will judge them forever in eternity because they did not witness to that man because morally sound is not enough. A child of God ought to be morally sound. The man's not going to commit adultery. The man is not going to lie. He's not going to cheat. He's not going to live off somebody else. He's a good, morally sound man like that. But every one of God's children, God will hold you accountable after you're born again to be morally sound to all of your neighbors and your family. God will. You better change your mind. If you are saved, if you are really saved, you will change your mind what is right and what is wrong. You will. What did it cost God to buy you 
out of slavery of sin. It cost, it cost God, the Son, to buy you out of your sin. It cost Him. Jesus, it says here that the fullness of God had the divine powers and the deities and the attributes of God dwelled in God the Son. Everything that we know of God by revelation and manifestation to our physical senses is God the Son. And God the Son came in this world and lived a perfectly moral life because we haven't. Now when you're saved, God gives you the power to do things. Now I said here that he reconciled all things unto himself or unto him having made peace through the blood of the cross. Now when you come to the God and when, when you come to God and when you are saved, God forgives you of every sin that you have committed in your life. And you are saved forevermore from that point of time on. But after we are saved, and if we continue to sin and live in sin, therefore, we will pay for those sins. We will pay for those sins. You will pay for those sins, and your children will. What is James talking about? In the book of James, he said there's a sin unto what? What did James say? There's a sin. He said, I tell you to pray for a brother. Pray for him. But sometimes it is a sin unto death. God leaves us in this world and he calls us to account to be his ministers, doesn't he? I can send angels down here. During the tribulation period, who are going to be witnesses for the Lord during the tribulation period? Not the churches. Not Israel, so to speak. Who's going to be the witnesses during the church age, uh, during the tribulation period? God chooses to, to, uh, to witness the people, to message people in a different way during their period of time. There are two witnesses, aren't there? These are two supernatural witnesses of some sort. I don't know whether John, Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, Moses, Elijah, uh, John, Enoch. Many people have different ideas of who those two witnesses are, but they are two miraculous, <coughs> gospeling witnesses. And then there's something else from the heavens. Angels cry out the gospel. They preach the gospel from the heavens as they're flying through the heavens. Angels do. Angels. That's what's going to happen during the tribulation period. But right now, we live in the church age, and God calls all the saved to be a witness for Him at this period of time. It says, having made peace, the rainy is peace, and poie is, uh, is to make. Having made peace through the blood of the cross. Dia tu haimatos. To staru. Staru. This word cross. Now the Job witnesses, they'll say, well, that's not a cross, that's a stake. <coughs> Job witnesses just don't understand what this word means. Words evolve, don't they? This word <coughs> means crucifixion. That's what that word staros means means crucifixion. I need somebody that can't do anything with a hand. <laughs> if I want to open a jar, I have to get my wife to hold one side of it. The uh, Ninevites invented crucifixion, but it was not called crucifixion back then. It was called staking or impaling people. All right? How they would kill people, it was a... If you had a capital sentence, on you, 
a capital, if you committed what they call a capital crime, and you didn't have to do much to do that sometimes, if, in Nineveh, if you look wrong, you might become a victim of capital punishment. In uh, Nineveh, which is Syria today, out on the side of the roads, here's the roadside, here's where everybody's going up and down the road. This is the main highway. This is Highway 178, Highway 99, Interstate 5, okay? Not only were, <laughs> there weren't any private executions, they were all public. They tried to scare people to death. In the tribulation period, there's going to be publicly, uh, people are going to be beheaded publicly over television. That's what the, the book of Revelation says. They're going to see it all over the world. These are public executions. Okay? Now, all along the road, there were stakes like this. They would take stakes. They would take a, a stake, probably something about that big around, a pole, and they would sharpen the end of that pole to a very sharp point. And this is gruesome to think about. But they would take a person and they would take their clothes all off of them and they would set them right on that pole and that pole would go up through their body. And when it would finally get up to their heart or their internal organs, as it would, they would grease that pole. And they would slip down slowly and it would rupture all of their organs in their body and they would finally bleed to death. But sometimes they might stay there for a day or two. That's what that word Stavros, that's where it came from. All right. Later on, the Romans used the same term, Stavros. They said, well, now, you know, if this here, if somebody will stay here alive and they're sitting up here, they're just hurting internally and, and it's horrible. We're going to make it worse. The criminals that are, going to be, that are going to be executed that have a crime against the state of Rome, we're going to do worse than that to them. We're going to take this stick now, and we're going to put it out in the public where everybody can see it. We're going to strip all their clothes off so they're naked before everybody. And you know, that's, and you, you, a person with some modesty, they don't want to be naked. People have dreams of being naked in public, you know, and, and scaring them. You know, people do that. So the Romans, they're going to take a kind of a railroad tie looking affair here, a big beam, and then they're going to take another beam and they're going to put it on the top. And they could either make it a towel or they could put it on up here like this. Now during Christ's time, Staros was like this, okay? This is a Roman form. The Romans would put a little seat pad right there and they would put another pad down here and it would be sticking out like here's the deal and out on the side there would be a little thing there for you to set upon a little bit and then they would put a piece out here like this where they'd take your feet and drive nails through the top of both of them and then up here at the top they had these nails and they would drive the nail. Now if you put it right through here it can tear out of your hand. With the weight it can tear out of your hand here. So they took a nail like this and sometimes they would put washers on it and it would actually be built up like this and would turn down a little bit. They would take this nail and they would put it right through this part of your wrist right there. How many of you have car carpal tunnel syndrome? Here's a real good example of it right here. I had carpal tunnel surgery one time. In all of your fingers, there is a tremendous sense of feeling in there. You have, how many can feel real good with your fingers? That's how you feel the things. You can close your eyes and you can feel where the corner is. You can feel the grains of things. You can feel any imperfection anywhere. You can feel that with your fingers. The reason why you can do that is because there's nerves running all through your hand. The Romans knew this. So they take this nail and they stick it right through the carpal tunnel area. Not only there's several little bones in there, but they stick it through there because it's going to hold right there. There's two big bones that come down through here and then it connects to your wrist and they drive it right straight through there. And so they'd live longer and suffer for days sometimes. Sometimes the shock of a person that had a bad heart, they die. They're just being nailed to the cross. Boy, that was merciful. They'd nail their feet here, they'd put this thing down on the ground 
they lay them out here and they lay the body out here and stretch their arms out. Nail a nail there, nail a nail there, nail their feet there. And then so they, could, they couldn't breathe unless they pulled themselves up, pushed themselves up with their feet and pulled up with their arms. When they laid down like this, it was kind of pulled their shoulders out of joint. And they couldn't get a breath. To exhale and to breathe, they had to push themselves up. And to rest, they put this little thing for their butt to set on. So they could kind of rest a little bit, pull against their arms. <coughs> but everything they did was horrible pain. Now let's look at this, what Jesus did for your sins. Now, this is the death that he died, the most horrible death. How about if they did crucifixion out here on, on Chester Avenue today for any criminal, for any child molester, for any bank robber, for any uh, murderer in Bakersfield? How about if they lined Bakersfield up with crosses and they crucified people like they crucified them here? How many bank robberies and things do you think we'd have in Bakersfield? Zero. Scare the daylights out of them, wouldn't it? I want to tell you something. God hates sin so much that He died for your sins. Like this. The death of the cross. The blood of the cross. His blood was spilled here. That's horrible. Having made peace by the agency or through the blood of the staru. Well, that word staru had changed from stake in Nineveh's time to the cross in Christ's time. <coughs> Through him, it says here, dia altu, and that's in parentheses, of course, but it's understood regardless. Through him, whether upon the earth or whether in the heavens, Christ died Christ's atonement was universal. And I don't mean that everybody in the world is going to be saved regardless of what decision they make. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not a general, uh, I, I don't believe in, in universal atonement in that way. But I do mean that Jesus Christ died for everybody that was ever born in this world. And that Jesus Christ died for the world itself, for the dirt that you walk on. The very pleasures that you exist and walk and, and, the, and the, the trees and the flowers that you smell and see, Christ died to redeem all of that back to His realm, to His heavenly kingdom. Every star twinkling in the sky, Christ died for that. And that which drove the nail so hard in these hands was our sin. And we have to get down and realize our sin, Christ killed our Lord and Savior on that cross. Our sins did that to Him. I don't care about anybody else's, your sins. Your sins drove Christ to the cross. There are people that are in the world today that never ask the Lord to forgive them. And they go on and, and the worst thing that they come before, you know what the unforgivable sin is? You know what the unforgivable sin is? Sin against the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit convicts your heart of sin and righteousness and judgment to come, you don't do it. That's what the sin against the Holy Spirit is. If God is convicting your heart of sin and righteousness and what truth is, and you just go on and walk out the door and never listen, you just go on your merry way, watch out. You're guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. Everything that is on the earth and everything in the heavens, Jesus died for. He died for the, the blackest sinner in this world, the darkest sins. The darkest sins He died for. You know, we categorize sins. We think about those horrible, hideous sins. But what is sin? The Bible tells you what sin is. 
What does the Bible tell us to do? To go out and work for a living, enjoy what we do, raise our families in the fear and admonition of the Lord, be faithful to our mates, raise our children to be citizens. <coughs> That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. That is, you know, the world, the, the United States government expects you to do that. Do you know that? You need to send your children to school. You need to teach them good work ethics. Work ethics. The government expects that of you. If they find out if you're not doing the things that you should in your home, they take those children out. They put them in somebody else's home. They will. That's a shame, too, isn't it? That that has to be done. That's wrong. God expects that. In the law of Moses, all of that is there. It's there. It's just, just go read it. It's all there. It tells you all about that. <coughs> Now let's look at verse 21. We covered part of this sin problem. Kai, Demos, Pote, Ontas, Apel, La, Tri, O, Menos. Well, that's a long word, isn't it? Kai, Extros, Te, Dianu, In, Toys, ergois. Toys, ponerois. Well, here we are right in the middle of it again. <coughs> and ye then, and ye, who's he talking to? Well, Paul's writing, he's writing to the church at Colossae. But that's primarily who this letter's to. But is it to us today? as churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, but ye, at ye, that's accusative plural. Then, and then we have the word being, accusative plural, present, participle, and active. That's, a, that's from, the word being there, it comes from I am, okay, Amy. I am. But it means being, being. But then ye being. And then we have the word apel, lo, Trio Manus. Having been alienated. We, before we were saved, we were alienated. We are enemies of God. Enemies of God. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, who whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But does God love sinners, really? Right here it says He hates them. Having been alienated, Kai ekthrus. What's this ekthrus? We are God haters. <clears throat> having been alienated from God, having become sinners in our lives, having become sinners by choice, having become sinners by knowledge. There's a time as, as a little child when we sin, we learn how to sin, don't we? We learn by the nature of, of Adam in us. We learn how to lie, we learn how to cheat, we learn how to blame shift, we learn how to do all this stuff. It's never your fault, is it? It's never your fault. It's always somebody else's fault. But what that does is it alienates us from God. It makes us God-haters and God hates us because He hates the sin in our lives. Being, uh, having been alienated and enemies, active haters in the Dianus, Dianus there, that Dianus. What in the world is this Dianus? Remember I gave you the five words for mine here a while back, didn't I? Dianus. It means that all the way through your mind that it is absolutely infected with evil. Romans, the first chapter, talks about people that are infected with sin and evil. And he gave them over to the unimpure lusts. Because once we become alienated from God, once 
that we become enemies with God. And God hates us. He allows us sin to just completely control our minds. He turns sin loose on us. He does. He turns the devil loose on you. And he tells you what that kind of sin is. This cross references right with Romans, the first chapter. Enemies in the mind. Then it says, in the works. In the perversion. In the mind, our mind becomes corrupt. Romans, the first chapter, says that people uh, would not follow the will of God, would not adhere to it repentance. And God gave them over to men, to homosexuality, and women to homosexuality. And it told, it tells extremely, just straight out, what it is. Men and men, and women and women. Our minds become twisted and screwed up. Twisted. Twisted minds. In the works, ergos. The word work means the product of employment. What did you put your hands to today? Were they the works of God or the works of the flesh? That's what it says. The works. And then it says, in the ponerois. Not only in poneros, but panerois. We have works. We have enemies. <coughs> and it's in the mind, singular, each and every one gets twisted in their mind. And then the works, the products of employment, the works of their hands become twisted with evil. Ponerois. Sex becomes a god. For the lust of sex, many people will never be saved. For the twisted, perverse, sex for hire, perversion, homosexuality, whatever. That's what this word means, polaroids. Now there's words for evil in the Bible. One of them is fala, fala. <clears throat> All right, that fala. That means hellish things. It means garbage. It means refuse. It's related uh, to uh, hell, hellish things. The things that lost sinners do. That's what follow means. We can get the word folly from that, huh? Follow. Then we have the word cockles. Cockles. Alright? That word cockles. That just means the Adamic nature, sinful things. Alright? Now, the first word there, follow, that means things that are related to hellfire. That's the reason why people go to hellfire. In the, in the last chapters of the book of Revelation, John wrote, the people that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God, and they will not be in the presence of God. And he names them all. And that's what's been named off right here in this verse again. And then we have the word poneros here. That is evil, perverse, and twisted. Now, the Bible, God, that is, not the Bible, God created man. He created man. It says in the Garden of Eden that God placed man in the garden. <coughs> but he created man from the same elements as he created the dust of the ground from. I want you to understand he didn't create him from dirt. He didn't create him from a mud ball. He didn't make a mud ball and form man into it. He formed man as he formed the dust of the ground, not from it. Man's a primary creation of God. It said he formed man as he formed the dust of the ground, and he breathed the livings of lives into him. Oof. And he breathed into him, as far as I can tell, he breathed blood into him. Because what carries life in it in your body? Blood. When your heart quits beating, you die. 
Your blood quits going. Life is in the blood. That's why in the Old Testament, God didn't want people eating blood. Because life's in the blood. You take and cut a, a frog's heart out, and that frog's going to be dead. You take a cut a lamb's heart out, and it's going to be dead. It doesn't live after that. Blood is necessary for life. In the Old Testament, God breathed into Adam the breathings of life. Then he took Adam and put him in the garden. And he named all the animals. And by the way, I'm going to tell you this right now. Should have done that left-handed. <laughs> My flesh is dying. <laughs> he took Adam and he put him out there in the garden. And, he, and God created animals for, the, for companions. He didn't create animals to begin with to eat. All right? Adam did not eat any flesh, as far as I can tell, ever in his life. God created Adam and he put him out there and he said he didn't find a helper or a companion suitable for him. Then he says, God says he took from Adam, out of Adam he took woman, which means out of Adam, ish is the word for man, and isha is the word in Hebrew for woman, out of man. He took them, and then he placed them back together in marriage. Now when God created Adam, and he created, then he took Eve out of Eve, out of Adam, and created the woman, in man and woman he gave the desire for a man and a woman to be together. That's what you call sexual desire. And it's also called companionship. It's totally normal for a man and a woman to want to be with each other. But God decided that that companionship would be in marriage and marriage only. That's it. Everything outside of that is perverse and twisted. That's it. And it's between a man and a woman. God made man and woman where they would fit together. If you, I don't have to explain that to you. I think you understand what I'm talking about. God made that. God did that. He made every sensory organ and nerve in your body to where you would desire one another. And that's normal in marriage. But when it becomes prostitution, when it becomes homosexuality and lesbianism, it is wrong. It is wrong. Then that is perverted. It is twisted. It is changed. God made man and woman. And he sets the, God set the boundaries. God never made one person like that be like they are. There is a, a mental choice in their mind. And that choice usually takes place after they have rejected the truth. That's what Romans, the first chapter, and that's what the first chapter of Colossians says right here. These verses are very plain. Colossians 1 and verse 22. And then I'm going to turn you loose. 1 and 22. <clears throat> Nini, day, apokata laksen, in, to, somati, teis, sarkos, autu, dia, tu, thanatu, para, stese, himas, agus, kais, amumus, kai, anek, kletos, but now be reconciled in the body of the flesh of him through the death look at that he has reconciled, he's brought you back he's brought you out of sin in his body, by his body by his very flesh Jesus Christ was God the Son and God in flesh and God tasted and communed with mankind in flesh and he didn't do it so that he could understand how man was. He, could, he, he did it for one reason. So that no man would ever have an excuse to say anything contrary to what the Word of God says. Any sins that you have in your life, Jesus Christ was acquainted with those sins and those lusts because God became flesh. 
And when you go before God, you will not say, Oh, Lord, I couldn't help you. And God will say, And I did. And I did it for you. Not only did I do it for you, but after you were saved, I gave you power. I gave you dynamis. Well, after you're saved, when you want to sin, you sin because you want to. And of course, the lost world is captivated, captivated by it. The lost man, the Adamic man, he is engulfed and he's enchained in sin. Saved man is set free. We think so much about drugs and, and uh, all the things that drugs bring on, prostitution and, uh, and stealing and lying and killing, all of the murderous things that they do as drug addicts to support their habits. And there's a ministry through our church here. It's called Set Free. You know something? The Lord Jesus Christ sets you free from the, from the death of this flesh from the power of the flesh that we live in. Through the death to present ye holy and unspotted, blameless and irreproachable down in the presence of God. Isn't that a beautiful verse? We'll look at that one some more next week. We're going to quit right there. No, we won't look at it next week. We're going to have to look at it three weeks from now. The ungodly buzzards won't let us come to I I don't know. I mean, it's two first weeks. Wednesday, I mean, it, it'll be three weeks from now. Two I weeks in a row, we won't be here. I don't know what date it is, Marilyn. I have it right here. Okay. It's uh, it's with a it's with a book that says uh, in here. Our next session of classes will begin Wednesday, January 12th, and Sunday, January 16th. Okay, I think we're going to have one class before that. Because if we start our... We, see, their classes are finished. Ours are still going. All right. Okay. All right. Anyway...